Buenas tardes eh, a todas y bienvenidas. Es un placer estar aquí con vosotros en esta última sesión actividad vinculada al programa público de la exposición que todavía podéis ver hasta el domingo en la planta menos uno, Inteligencia Líquida, eh, de la que tuve el placer de formar parte del equipo curatorial. Eh, me gustaría, por supuesto, dar las gracias a los ponentes de hoy, a los artistas que también están invocados eh, con las obras que vamos a ver eh, y que vamos a rastrear y a las instituciones que han hecho posible este evento hoy. Eh, por supuesto, al Museo Nacional Thyssen-Bornemisa, que es nuestro principal colaborador y coorganizador de la Iniciativa de Estudios Independientes Organismo, a mis compañeros de organismo, eh, que llevan el equipo que lleva organismo, que son María Wey, John Aranguren y Nicola Arzur Cabrera, a las coordinadoras de este evento del programa público y de la exposición, María Rubio, Araceli Galán del Castillo y Begoña de la Riva, y por supuesto a la Fundación TVA21, Thyssen Bornemisa Art Contemporary y eh, TVA21 Academy. Así como para resumiros eh, lo que va a consistir el día de hoy, de, vamos, esta tarde que vamos a pasar juntos, eh, voy a hacer yo una introducción, seguidamente va a haber las ponencias de Ana Secor que está aquí con nosotros y luego eh, David Peña Guzmán que se conecta desde Estados Unidos eh, por diferido y eh, durarán 20 minutos cada una, luego tendremos ocasión de tener una conversación con ellos que os abro y espero que, que queráis participar y añadir vuestros comentarios. Y acabaremos con la presentación, proyección de la película de Fabricio Terranova, Isabel Stenger, Fabrique l'espoir au bout du gouffre, eh, que mm, es un placer también tenerla aquí, recién estrenada en junio de este año en Bruselas y la tenemos en Madrid por primera vez. Eh, la presentaciones van a ir en inglés, yo voy a cambiar a inglés para facilitar la conversación con los ponentes y para la traductora. Eh, si alguno necesita eh, traducción, se puede coger a la entrada eh, y así. So I switch to English that you can also follow. Um, just before I open, I wanted to, to mention that while this session is dedicated to dreams, um, doesn't mean that we feel disconnected for the present times, uh, wor words and words and the constant call for an urgent season fire. So for um, fire to be um, a case for hidden away from the present, or on the contrary, I hope that we will together understand how the dreams operating in connecting us to the current transformation. So this evening, we'll consider the dream's implication from the comprehension of the ecological, earthly, and oceanic transformation, but the route is open for further investigation and implication. So um, last night, you dreamed you were a fish with legs. Anoche soñaste que eras un pez con patas. Whispers Beatriz Santiago Muñoz. The, this voice over her three 60 millimeters film installation, Pájaro Comeme Philoctetes, that is um, at the space, invokes the space of the dreams, the onidic time, and its possibilities to reconcile with the present while animating our imagination. Dreams, fish, fish with legs, the real, the unreal, all part of the fluid, the aquatic realm belonging to our brain and to the ocean. Filmmaker and artist Beatriz Santiago Muñoz, one of the artists, as I was mentioning, exhibit in liquid intelligence, has for some years now engaging uh, with what she calls sensory unconscious. And is a method and a practice through the dreams as a mean of channeling, if you want, to connect with the surrounding. We observe how constant geological transformations are manifested in human and animal bodies, consciously and unconsciously accentuating certain um, sensibilities. The possibility of dreams becoming, on the one hand, a public collective testimony of those changes, and on the other hand, 
that the dreams could reveal a reality before it has fully occurred, before changes are absorbed, made obviously visible, also with this catastrophic effect, has animated Beatriz's works. The space of dreams as reconciliation of what is happening became an interesting tool, one that we want to explore tonight. Uh, more precisely, Beatriz wanted to see what the dreams could tell us about the relationship with what we so-called nature. And in this period of constant transforma transformation by hurricanes and sea level rise uh, that were changing the landscape um, in uh, Puerto Rico, Santiago Muñoz decided, among many places, but in this context is Puerto Rico, um, she decided to approach those people living in the south coast of uh, uh, Beatriz uh, land, um, na natal Puerto Rico, and listen and record the dreams of those who are more attuned to those transformations and those changes in so-called nature. So we wonder, what do we position ourselves while the environment and us with it is changing, transforming rapidly, speedily, expeditiously. What newly imaginaries and visual narratives are being created from the experience that we are experiencing as transformation of this so-called commonly referred as nature. When uh, we recognize that human intelligence has trapped ourselves in a bubble of false anthropocentrism, and this is what we were discussing in the exhibition, and we open up and started to recognize the many forms of intelligence that surround us, we spin, we dance in circle. I think those images uh, transfor transport us to the uh, underwater flotation mode look into those transformations and more overly, attentively learning from the entanglements. And I know it's a very overused term, but I think it is still relevant to honor the ecology feminist theories uh, because we are invoking them tonight quite often. So the question grows, what world are we seeing, narrating, <coughs> visually creating, and how do we accept the changes that are occurring around us? And tonight, we are going to review the role of dreams, to think and, and I open quote, see the world as it is, borrowing the words of Fabrizio Terranova, through recognizing first and foremost the interconnecting forces that mean conductive intelligence, that that was another way um, that uh, Chus Martinez referred to the liquid intelligence, so another of her coined terms when we open and uh, attune to the more than human intelligence. So for the dreams reconnected with Beatriz Santiago Muñoz's work, Ana Secor introduced the space of dreams as conductive of knowing and not knowing what is known, of the dream in the matter, and particularly in the water, and how it is experienced and occur physically and speculatively exploring a term that she has coined, a space-time conscious. And in a similar vein, David Peña Guzman uh, wonder, and I am open his um, open a quote, uh, pan out and the bigger questions become, what goes in the minds of known human animals when they sleep? And he goes and after say, or do their uh, memes simply their minds simply plumb into a psychic void in which no conscious experience takes root. Uh, David has done an unusual and a thrilling work on examining uh, in his uh, book that he will uh, bring and invoke in his presentation, examine the scientific data regarding the life and dreams capacity of animals and consequently analyzing its philosophical derives. From this occasion, David will focus on the marine life to see how they dream and then enter into the philosophical amplification of that acceptance of the animal oniric realm and hint into where their imagination will be. How do they see the world and how the natural transformation um, come to them as they experience it in the dreams, if they experience it? This is all a speculation. So before giving the floor to the speakers, I will quickly just read their short bios. 
Um, Anna G. Sikor is a feminist cultural and political geographer, professor at the Department of Geography at Durham University in England. She received her PhD in geography from the University of Colorado Boulder in 2000. Over the past two decades, her work has contributed to the feminist political geography, cultural geography, ge urban geography, and many more. And from 2016 to 2022, uh, she served as the editor of Cultural Geographers. And um, uh, Dr. Peña Guzman received his PhD in philosophy from Emory University in 2015. Her work on animal, his work, no, he works, sorry, on animal studies, the history and philosophy of science, continental philosophy, and theories of conscious. He is the author of When Animal Dreams, The Hidden World of Animals Consciousness, and co-author of Chimpanzee Rise, The Philosopher Brief, and co-host of the philosophy podcast Overthinking that I will recommend to all of you. It's very, um, very good, very uh, easy to engage. So thanks so much. And um, the floor is yours, Anna. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Maria for inviting me. And thank you to TBA for hosting me and Maria Rubio for organizing me. So I'm very happy to be here. My aim with this talk today is to proliferate what is enigmatic in the central theme of the exhibit, Liquid Intelligence. I will do this by way of an idea of elemental dreaming that I will attempt to bring into being by means of a conjuration, that is, experimentally, in a series of cuts. So this presentation progresses by way of montage and is designed to summon something that is inherently elusive, something that cannot be known in a straightforward way. The dreams of water are destined to slip through our grasp. The result of this experiment is a fragmentary text composed of parts that collide psychically, molecularly, atmospherically, with the aim of evoking, rather than arguing, its subject into existence. I will be using images from three main sources. You should be able to recognize them from this. So, to begin with, consider that water is not that good at remembering. In the words of Aaron Petit, a glaciologist at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, as it turns out, water by itself is not actually that good at remembering how to become ice. What she means is that as water cools down, as the molecules start to slow their movement, they get a bit closer together but they don't quite remember how they are supposed to join together into the stable structure of ice. To freeze is not a given to water. The very cold molecules need what is called a nucleator, the intrusion of a tiny solid, such as a speck of dust. The solid particle gives the water a structure to mimic Dropped into the pure cold water, the nucleator is a reminder and a command. Ice. The best nucleator is a speck of ice itself. There is a remembering and a forgetting. This is not the same remembering and forgetting that might be the property of a human being. Neither does it belong to water. There is knowledge a matrix giving rise to what is possible and what is not, what can follow and what must not. And yet there is also a knowledge that does not know itself, the know-how of becoming ice. The nucleator is a molecule whose form itself carries a message, a command, ice. The knowledge of the angles and relations of solidity that the nucleator conveys is not subjectivized, 
it is passively registered. When the command comes, it arrives as if from outside, the speck of dust, the snowflake. But this icing was always possible. It was, it is, a capacity of water, whether known or unknown to it. Ice is the past and the future of water. What is playing out in this drama of the becoming ice of water? Following feminist quantum physicist, philosopher Karen Barad, we might see in this scene the ongoing differential articulation of the world as taking place through a non-linear enfolding in which the past, present, and future are threaded through one another. This is what Barad calls the intraactive becoming of space-time matter, through which the non-linearity of time is enfolded with the discontinuities of space and the responsiveness of matter. There is also a role for knowledge in this articulation of the world. Barad's work draws out the philosophical implications of quantum physicist Neil Bohr's epistemological lesson that our knowledge-making practices are material enactments that contribute to and are part of the phenomena that we describe. Matter will be a particle or a wave, depending on the apparatus used to measure it. Positions and states are superimposed until observed. The future retrofits the past to correspond with the present. Our knowledge of the world affects the world as we know it. That's quantum physics. But there is something funny about the story of water and its icing, for it concerns what water knows, but doesn't know it knows, regarding its own capacities. Not only are water and the nucleator engaged in sensing and signaling to each other, but there is something enigmatic in the signal that is transmitted. The nucleator, a speck of dust, a snowflake, arrives as if from outside to impart what is already known, what has already happened and will not stop happening, the becoming ice. The functioning of this unknown knowledge is not reducible to the entanglement of matter and meaning. When the nucleator arrives, the water encounters its own alterity its capacity for solidity as a forgotten knowledge that has nonetheless been preserved. The nucleator remembers for or in the place of the forgetful substance. There is something of knowledge in the real, a liquid intelligence that operates via an unconscious knowledge without a subject. This is what I am calling the space-time unconscious, an unconscious supplement to what is already there, a dimension of dreaming folded into and unfolding with the material discursive becoming of the more than human world. The space-time unconscious refers to an unconscious supplement to matter, an elemental dreaming. In truth, the more than human has only rarely been spliced with an unconscious channel. Nonetheless, if you listen, there is a hum, like the buzz of a loose or overloaded wire. Incipient passions and alchemical affinities stir the air. What is it that buoys the elemental lure that geographer Sasha Engelman writes of so beautifully? How is something like desire generated in the heating and cooling of molecules, updraft and downdraft, the gathering storm? If more than human suggests an excess, more, the unconscious in space and time exhibits an, an affinity for what is more or less, the inexact, the decomposed, and the decomposable. Space-time unconscious redistributes the human and the non-human as fragments, unfolds them, flays them, 
stuffs them and stitches them, rearranges them, composts them. In this dispersal, the space-time unconscious is recognizable as a species of what is known in psychoanalytic called geography as a distributed notion of the unconscious, an understanding of the unconscious not as submerged in the depths of individual psyches, but instead distributed spatially in and beyond the body and over distance. The unconscious in this sense is not contained or walled off within the bounds of a human or even the human. Instead, the dislocations and disorientations that are the observable signs of the unconscious are manifest in and through the objects, spaces, and temporalities of the world's unfolding. This notion of the unconscious in the real allows us to consider how unknown knowledge outside the symbolic hooks directly into the matter of what happens. What enables such a thought of the unconscious, which does not become a collective unconscious in the Jungian sense, but rather a distributed one that is more than human? Liquid intelligence calls forth a knowing that is not the knowing or unknowing of a conscious subject. This is not repressed knowledge, but nonetheless it is a knowledge that is at once forgotten and functioning, manifest in its effects in the enfolding of space, time, and matter, such as the becoming ice of water. This may seem foreign, to what is typically associated with psychoanalysis, centered on subjects as speaking beings. But one can find a vocabulary for such an unconscious in the real, in Lacan's later teachings, where he elaborates an idea of the unconscious, not in terms of repressed meaning, but as itself an enigmatic enunciation. Something is articulated in what happens, in the matter at hand, that has a sense beyond meaning. The nucleator that brings the idea of ice to water signals, but it is not one in a coherent chain of signifiers. The speck nucleator operates without a grammar its effects arise by way of significance or signifierness rather than signification. That which is not directly decipherable, that is, a speck of dust, does not have a place in language, but it has arisen from the body or the material sensorium and now returns to it as its uncanny limit and retroactive cause. A snowflake, a solid form of water, returns to water as though bearing a message of the past, the future, a forgotten capacity, a dormant potentiality, a dream. The dream is an asteroid. It carries within a form, a memory, a speck. As Walter Benjamin writes, the dream waits secretly for the awakening. This is uh, in the London Freud Museum. This was his office in London, and there was an exhibit in it. I took the, the, the photo. Each awakening is embedded within a dream. Water awakens to keep dreaming. This dream is reality. To intercept the dreams of water is to tune into what is uncanny, to water, what returns without having left, the unknown known. This is not the same problem as animal dreams, where what is at stake is a question of consciousness. Just as Nietzsche said, there is no doer behind the deed. When we speak of liquid intelligence, liquid dreaming, we might say, there is no dreamer behind the dream. The space-time unconscious does not rest on a claim for consciousness in the usual sense, but instead on an elemental knowing and not knowing. As with animal dreams, the problem is not least one of method. How does something like an operation of an unconscious manifest 
without being anchored to something recognizable as consciousness. What does it mean to speak of an unconscious unfolding of time, space, and matter? How can something like a dreaming that is not the exclusive property of a human or a animal subject be revealed? Well, it is not all the same between speaking beings and water molecules, but we can experiment. The cut is undoubtedly the most effective mode of psychoanalytic interpretation, says Lacan. Cutting, punctuating, interrupting, listening for breaks and slips, scanning a verse, listening to its rhythm and marking its meter, this is psychoanalytic technique but also a technique of artists, filmmakers, who use methods of cutting and splicing to disrupt the expected and cause something other to catalyze, an excess or a remainder. Intellectually and aesthetically, the interpretation of the unconscious is entwined with the punctum of the photograph, the defamiliarization practiced in the avant-garde movements of Dadaism and Cubism, and features of uncanniness and derangement within surrealism and the d d digital. Cutting, distorting, folding in, hollowing out, arraying, layering, intersplicing, repeating. This is from the film. The dream is always a return, uncanny, vi visceral. The film of Beatriz Santiago Munoz bird eat me, Philoctetes, immerses the viewer into the space and time of a dream. The sea, the shore, a layered soundscape that is at once natural and unnatural. Objects appear and disappear over the mouth of a cave. Something appears across the breach in the place where there isn't something. A dog roots around on the shore. A man is at home smoking in a hammock on the shore. Philoctetes is condemned between water and land, life and death, human and non-human, a fish with feet, a man with bat wings. The sound and the images of the film create a strange, unnerving texture, a tactility, wind and salt water on skin, immersion. It is as if one is dreaming, lost in the folds of time, space, and matter. There in the three projections, the symbolic, the material, and the mythic. To hold a film on the tip of one's tongue in language, in the as if, as if it were a dream presented for interpretation, as if it were a metaphor, one might be able to collapse it into a singular overdetermination, into its own representation. One might be able to deflate the troubling enigma of it, but this is not my aim. Philoctetes' foot festers. Philoctetes, the hysteric, the wounded, the one who wants his wound, Something returns when the waves come in again and when the mist rises in the trees. The repetition of the tides, the dream and its awakening, the film circles the split between the empty space and the object that covers it, between its three projections, between shore and sea, the roar of the waves and some other ocean of sound, tinnitus. Like the rotation of the stars, the dream tides are inexorable. In Bird Eat Me, Philoctetus is dreaming. He dreams himself into the non-human. He becomes more or less human in his dreaming. Bat wings carry him from the island. He is back home to smear the city walls with a name, with shit. This is a dream within the film, but two, the film is itself another dream, and this telling, yet another, e each circles the same whole and returns as its own minimal difference. 
None of this is representable except projected and dissected. Snip, splay, pin to the medium. Spread out against the sky, it seems as though the stars are that which always returns to the same place. Little cuts in the fabric of the night. Lacan says that these slits are what allow us to map the real. And yet, not even the stars are where they seem to be. Lights all askew in the heavens, read the headline of a special cable to the New York Times on the 10th of November, 1919, after an eclipse verified Einstein's predictions based on his theory of relativity. The stars are also not when they appear to be, what with the time it takes for their light to become visible to us. Some might even be already dead, having long since inverted into black holes. But nobody need worry. Like the dead who appear in dreams as though oblivious to their own demise, likewise the light that continues to travel from the star knows nothing of its death and anyhow, from our great distance and from within the blip of our temporal being, the stars appear not as objects, but as cuts, as a map of something real, as wishing wells. Distortion is all there is. Objects, fish, flowers, weapons, alternate in their presence and absence, transform from being locatable in reality to being unlocatable in the real. What is an elemental dreaming? The dream is a lightning flash that reveals the darkness. It traces a boundary between what is illuminated and what is not. Conjoining the sky and the earth, the storm cloud and the ground, the dream lightning is an articulating edge, linking divergent, communicating series. Lightning distinguishes itself from the black sky, but must also trail it behind, as though it were distinguishing itself from that which does not distinguish itself from it. It is as if the ground rose to the surface without ceasing to be ground. Writes Deleuze, the lightning bolt emerges as a response to difference between the sky and the ground, but the cut of differentiation does not separate out an independent or autonomous entity. Like the dream and the awakening that it embeds, lightning traces the conjoining edge between contradictory states Something passes between the borders. Events explode, phenomena flash. For lightning to occur, a connection must be made between charged electrons in the sky and a, reciproc and a reciprocating filament from the ground. This takes place after much experimentation. The lightning bolt is what happens when awareness occurs. There is a chatter in the elemental field. Some of it is empty, but some seems to be part of the unfolding of both matter and meaning across interlocking phenomena, well beyond and calling into question what passes for human. The media of this communication are manifold, fields of transmission that range from the biogenic or the sedimentary to the atmospheric. As elemental geographers Sasha Engelman and Derek McCormick write, this means that sky, sea, and fire are message-bearing systems of a kind, offering signs, signals, or portents of things to come. It also means that there is a more than human distribution of capacities for the reception and interpretation of these signals. As physicist David Bohm writes, even an electron has at least a rudimentary mental pull. 
evident in how it participates in unfolding the meaning of the information that is implicit in the quantum field. We must be careful not to understand, says Lacan. I am trying to get you to go a bit beyond by inviting you to stop trying to understand, he says to his students in 1958. It is in this regard that I am not a phenomenologist. Not even the electron knows what it knows or what it is capable of. There are gaps. Something doesn't line up. R relays in the elemental field backfire become twisted and uncanny. It is not only sensible information, but unconscious knowledge that is transmitted in and through the message-bearing systems of an unfolding space-time matter. For Bohr, the electron's mental, mental pole emerges as both a cause and effect of how it unfolds, that is, interprets or responds to the enigmatic messages that it encounters. But the call comes from inside the house. The message is the receiver's own, returning, both familiar and strange. As Karen Barad explores, an electron emits a photon, progeny of its interaction with its own alterity, and then reabsorbs it. Water encounters its doppelganger and transitions. A swarm of spurting, pooling, charged electrons call forth their own dark precursor. Like in a time travel film or in analysis itself, the message to the subject is the subject's own. Operating the elemental media, the space-time unconscious is a demonic transistor, working a relay that runs on reversal estrangement and misalignment. The disturbance goes both ways. As media studies scholar John Doran Peters muses, if it is a mistake to think that nature is a subject that speaks intentionally, might it also often be a mistake to think the same of humans? While the particle exercises its mental pull, the dreamer particulates. The space-time unconscious flickers in the gap between the tense sky and the interested earth, between water and its own lost iciness. It twists, tosses, and turns between the dream and the awakening. It glitches in the blur between a myth and a man on the shore of an island. The stars or slits are dead or d d dust, disjunctive constellations. The cuts proliferate. They are intrusive signifiers that have fallen off the chain of meaning, but are full of signifierness, metaphors that generate no meaning, displacements that bring forth no being, they unleash enigmatic affects, strange yearnings, inexplicable repulsions, uncanny half-recognitions, emanations of an unknown knowledge in the real. These dreams are g g ghosts, transmissions of the space-time unconscious. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for the organizers who put together this wonderful event. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I will be. Of the elemental world. Um, which takes us beyond the realm of consciousness, beyond the realm of intentionality. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is talk a little bit about the intentional, the subjective, the conscious side of things with the recognition that the concept of the unconscious also plays a central role 
in my understanding of what I'm here going to be calling aquatic dreams. Um, and by aquatic dreams, I simply mean the dreams of animals that live in aquatic settings, whether they are marine mammals, whether they are fish, uh, so on and so forth. And much of what I will be discussing here, if I could go to the next slide now, is based on a book that I published this past year with Princeton University Press. Um, can we click on the next slide? I don't have control over the slides. Thank you. Um, and it's based on this book that I published with Princeton University Press about a year ago, entitled When Animals Dream, The Hidden World of Animal Consciousness. And this book, which is now available in Spanish, um, it, the translation just came out, uh, so I'm, I'm very uh, happy about that. In this book, what I try to do is give an account on the one hand of the scientific evidence that we have nowadays for thinking that human beings are not the only dreamers on Earth. And of course, that's not, an, that's not a claim that is likely to surprise anybody that has uh, spent any meaningful amount of time with animals. Uh, people who live with animals, who have relationships with animals, probably will tell you that um, they already have a sense that the animals they share their life with are dreamers. Um, but that belief, when articulated in a scientific context, tends to elicit a lot more skepticism and resistance um, than among um, non-scientific experts. And what I wanted to do in this book is first and foremost, think about whether maybe the available science that we have nowadays on animal sleep, on animal intelligence, on animal cognition, actually paints a picture of animals as dreamers already uh, in ways that the scientific community itself has not recognized. And so the first section of the book um, is largely empirical. It talks about a lot of um, empirical protocols, including a neuroscientific research on um, animals in laboratory settings, where the question is whether there are behaviors, um, bodily behaviors, and also patterns of neural activation that indicate non-human dream phenomenology. And because my own background as a, as a scholar is in philosophy, the second part of the book then turns the question from an empirical to a more theoretical and in some cases speculative register, where I try to think about what the implications of all this research might be for our understanding of animality as such. Who are animals such that they have this capacity to dream, which is to say to generate from out of themselves an entire simulation of the world under the most shocking physiological conditions possible, which is sleep. Because of course, during sleep, um, our relationship to our body changes in significant ways. And also our relationship to the world is shifted from the waking world in that our senses are diminished, right? We are cut off from the world. And yet it is precisely under these conditions that a very large number of non-human animals, um, and I, I here we'll be talking primarily about marine mammals, I'm sorry, marine animals, um, display this capacity uh, to generate a dream world that is replete with all of the features that are proper to those particular animals, to their memory, to their perception, and as I argue in the book, um, to their imaginations as well. So the book is a scientific and a philosophical exploration of the non-human uh, dream world and what the landscape of this world tells us about the psychic apparatus of these animals. And so um, from this, you should be able to know by now that I will be uh, giving a presentation that is more firmly rooted in phenomenology in questions of intentionality, in questions of subjectivity and consciousness um, and that, still raise, that, that still raise interesting uh, dilemmas about where the line between the conscious and the unconscious is to be found. 
Now, the book, as you can see, has an octopus on its cover. Can we please go to the next slide? And this is a reference to a case. It's the case of a particular octopus that was observed by a, by a biologist by the name of David Scheele, who noticed that the octopus in, in his tank, um, he lives with this octopus in his uh, home in Alaska, and this was the story was told in, in a documentary about uh, octopus cognition. And he noticed that when the octopus that lived with him went to sleep, the octopus would go through an almost cinematographic series of scenes that would be lived out through its chromatophoric system. So of course, octopuses are cephalopods that have a chromatophoric system on the skin, on the mantle, that allows them to change not just colors very rapidly, but also textures. And this is the, um, the material basis for their camouflaging capabilities. So octopuses can re resemble and mimic uh, pretty much any object that exists in their aquatic environment by controlling um, this chromatophoric system uh, by contracting their skin, making it change shapes, colors, shades, and so on and so forth. And uh, what you're seeing here is a drawing that appears in the book of this story of an octopus that in the middle of its sleep cycle changes from a very clear, um, this is the top, uh, this is the top part of the, uh, of the drawing from a complete white uh, all over the body to a very dark uh, purple-like, uh, almost black color, um, and then suddenly to a lighter color with, um, if you can see the, the, the depiction, you can see the change in the texture of the skin, indicating that the animal is not only changing color, but is now uh, having spikes coming out of its skin. And what we know about these displays, especially if we think about them, let's say, as cuts, uh, to keep in line with the previous presentations, as various cuts um, of a movie that is lived by an animal internally, what we realize is that they match very uh, well the behaviors that we would expect this animal to do were this animal to perform a concrete behavior of eating. So this is precisely what we observe in the waking world of octopuses. When they first capture a prey, then they descend to the bottom of the ocean to eat it. And because there is less light at the bottom of the ocean or at the bottom of the um, part of the ocean where they, where they live, they change into a darker color. Um, and afterwards they change into this uh, medium kind of uh, color with a heightened texture on the skin. And so what we see here is that the animal narrates at the level of the skin a reality that it is experiencing in the context of a dream. Um, and now, can we please go to the next slide? In the book, I talk quite a bit about octopuses, but I also talk about the oneric behaviors of a lot of other animals. And here I'm going to say a few things about the cuttlefish, which is a close relative to the octopus. Um, but before I do that, let me note that oneric behaviors, um, that's a term that is used in the scientific literature on dreaming and sleeping to refer to compartments of the body in all species that might indicate a dream experience. Oneric comes from the Greek word oneros, which means to dream. Therefore, oneric behavior simply means dream-related behaviors. What is interesting to me is that in the scientific literature, the term oneric is used in connection to a lot of other animals to talk about whether they move their limbs, whether they make facial gestures, whether they make vocalizations in the context of sleep. But even though the term is used very frequently when these behaviors are described, scientists tend to take a step back and 
they usually insert some disclaimers into their writing. So they will say, yes, we are noticing and observing and recording all of these oneric behaviors, but we cannot say, or we do not feel comfortable saying that these animals are in fact dreaming. And so you have this ambivalence built into a lot of scientific discourse on animals where we use terms that already have in them, baked into them, a reference to this internal subjective reality, which is dreaming, um, alongside these very explicit rejections, simply on the basis of the idea that animals who are not humans um, likely are not capable of complex mental feats or mental accomplishments like dreaming, uh, like language, like morality, like empathy, so on and so forth. Now, in the book, I talk about a number of empirical studies concerning cuttlefish that similarly focus on their chromatophoric uh, powers, um, very similar to octopuses. Um, and, and can we please go to the next slide? And what I am about to show you here is a series of um, it's a series of photographs taken of a cuttlefish over the course of 30 seconds. So beginning from the very top to the bottom, you see zero seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So what we have here is a temporal sequence of an animal, of a cuttlefish sleeping. And here, more so than in the previous one, even though this is slightly difficult to see because it's highly pixelated, this is from the original uh, publication where, this, uh, where these findings were reported. What you see are a series of changes that I want to draw your attention to. So the animal is pictured at the center of the picture. And from top to bottom over this half a minute, you see a couple of changes that are worth noting. The first one is the color of the entire animal. At the beginning, the animal is white, then it changes to a dark global um, coloration pattern, then it becomes lighter again and slightly darker again. So it's as if the animal, in terms of its color, it's simply pulsating, um, dark, white, dark, white, um, in the course of time. The second change that is happening while this animal is resting is that if you pay a close look on the right side of each photo, there is a tiny line at the front of the animal, which is the eye bar. It's basically this part of the animal, but on the you seen from the top part of the head. Um, so it's on the right top quadrant. You'll see a little line um, and the very top one, it's white. And then it changes into a dark color over time. So the eye bar has its own coloration pattern. The final and most important change in this case is that if you look at second 20, the third photo, you see the emergence on the very back of the animal of a white square shape. Um, and, and of course, this is in, in itself an interesting display, since it is the display of a geometrical figure in an aquatic environment that is not known for having um, right angles. And so what we see here is that the animal makes a display that is highly unusual, but that we know the animal makes whenever it is trying to defend itself against a predator. So the white square display is well known in cuttlefish research. And it is one way in which animals try to use their camouflaging abilities in order to disrupt the perceptual capacities of their predators. So the argument here is that predators have a normal idea. They have a perceptual schema of what a cuttlefish looks like. And so they go into the environment looking for a cuttlefish. When the cuttlefish makes a display of a white square, this interferes with the perceptual expectations of the predators and throws them off. Uh, so it's a, it's a defense mechanism, not quite camouflage, more so than um, I would say confusion. It actively interferes with uh, the inferences made by predators, uh, and it allows the cuttlefish to survive in a highly competitive um, predatory prey uh, environment. And here again, you see that that uh, white square 
appears over the course of the 30 seconds, suggesting that internally this animal might be living a reality in which it is prey rather than predator and in which it's trying to escape and making its classic display um, that has a defensive function. Now, let's go to the next picture. Here is a photo of what cuttlefish look like, just to give you a better sense um, of the intensity and the contrast of their coloration patterns, since that was very difficult to see in the um, white and black pictures that were published in a scientific publication. And so what we have here now is a story about octop octopuses and cuttlefish who, again, at the level of the body, are able to narrate a scene that is unfolding before their eyes in the context of sleep. But of course, this is easy to see largely because of the visual component of the chromatophoric system. And in fact, some people have argued that when studying dreams, researchers have a moral obligation to find and focus on animals that in some way exteriorize their dreams so that we don't have to conduct invasive, uh, harmful, unethical um, experiments on, on those that do not. Um, especially neuroscientific research that often involves uh, the opening up of the animal brains, the studying, the dissecting of the animal, uh, which entails their death. Now, in the book, I talk about quite a lot of animals that have this dreaming capacity, and that includes uh, not only cephalopods, I talk quite a lot about mammals, I talk about birds, I talk about um, some reptiles, and I also talk about monotremes, which are um, animals like, um, um, oh my gosh, the, the name is escaping me at the moment, monotremes that are um, typically confused, they're, they're an interspecies between um, birds and mammals, um, like the platypus, I'm sorry, um, and the echidna. Um, but here I want to shift to talking about another kind of marine animal, and that is a vertebrate fish. Because so far we've talked primarily about invertebrates, the cephalopods. Go to the next slide. Now, in 2009, there was a study published by a researcher out of Stanford by the name of Louis C. Lung, um, who published an article in the journal Nature entitled Neural Signatures of Sleep in Zebrafish. This is a zebrafish. It's a, it's a fish that's pretty much as big as your finger. It's relatively small, um, and it, it, in many ways, it is an archetypical fish. It's a vertebrate um, with... Um, uh, let's say, a relatively typical fish morphology and fish organization. Uh, so we're talking about an animal that looks like a lot of other fish. And in this research from 2019, the authors point out that it's very difficult to talk about fish experience and fish cognition for the simple reason that fish have a very different neural organization um, than human beings. Uh, for starters, they don't have what we have, which is the mammalian neocortex, the part of the brain um, that for a long time has been thought to differentiate, to, to, to differentiate us from the rest of the animal kingdom and to give us those higher order cognitive rational capacities um, that we associate with our quintessential humanity. But the authors point out that even though the central nervous system of fish and their brain is significantly different than the brain of mammals, and there is no point in denying that, there are some very interesting functional similarities, meaning that a very different neural arrangement, uh, like the fish brain, can achieve a similar function, perform a similar function as the mammalian central nervous system, despite it having a very different look. And one of the things that they found is that when these animals are asleep, we see in them the same propagating wave of neural activation that we know 
generates dreams in mammals. So in mammals, um, especially in human beings who have been the center of dream research, we have known for, for quite a long time that REM sleep and dreams are triggered by a wave of ascending activity that begins in the pons, um, which is uh, part of the brainstem, um, that be it begins a propagating wave of neural activity that goes into the geniculate body and then turns around and comes back into the occipital lobe, the back part of the brain that specializes in vision. And this wave of activity that goes through the pons, the geniculate body, and then back to the occipital lobe hence its name PGO, so it's just a kind of um, a circuit of activity, that wave is a signature that is associated with REM sleep and with dreams. And the authors realize that in these three to four centimeter fish, we also notice a similar wave ascending from their fish version of the pons, um, from their fish version of the pons into um, uh, their fish functional equivalent of the geniculate body and terminating into their version of the occipital lobe. Of course, in these animals, um, all of these structures have different names. Um, and so for them, it goes from the pons, we have that name for the fish too, then it goes into their midbrain and then into their telencephalic structure. But it's that same kind of loop that is highly correlated and in fact predictive of the fish version of REM sleep. Um, and so part of what the researchers discovered is that even in these quote unquote simple fish, we also have a differentiation between deep restorative sleep, the kind of slow wave sleep um, during which we are largely unconscious and then high activity uh, fast propagating wave sleep, which is what in mammals we call REM sleep, which is statistically associated um, uh, or correlated with dream reports. And so you see a parallel here um, from land to water at the level of dreams that suggests that complex cognitive and perceptual achievements can be manifested in radically different neural organizations. Um, can we please go to the next slide? Now, I just want to make a few observations or reflections here by way of conclusion about what the dreams of aquatic creatures teach us about uh, not just our place in the universe, but also about the aquatic environment in itself. First and foremost, I think these dreams bring into focus the fundamentally aquatic origin of consciousness. Uh, let's not forget that the first conscious beings that appeared on Earth, at least when we're talking about um, animals, living sentient creatures, um, rather than maybe um, psychic forces that occur at the um, physical or the material realm of existence, these animals unfolded in an ancient aquatic oceanic environment. Um, of course, researchers, especially evolutionary theorists, disagree about the point at which the first um, uh, form of consciousness emerged. Um, by and large, I think one of the best theories out there locates it uh, right before the Cambrian explosion, about 450 um, million years ago during the Edicorean period, when very simple forms of life emerged um, and began crawling um, at the bottom of the ocean, taking in nutrients and leaving a trace behind them through control of their body. Um, and so this ability of these ancient primordial organisms to move um, became essential for the development of consciousness. And in fact, this reminds us of the Greek philosopher Aristotle's uh, schema of, of the living world, where he says that the difference between plants and animals is that although we share the quote unquote vegetative functions like needing nutrition, 
what sets us apart from plants is that we have the capacity for movement um, and for movement through an environment which raises um, in many ways the kinds of challenges that we face and therefore triggers this, this need for animal perception and animal cognition. Uh, but still, the dreams of animals in the ocean are, are a reminder of the fact that we are fundamentally oceanic creatures from a phylogenetic perspective. Um, and in fact, I'm here uh, now thinking about this uh, on the spot, but one of Freud's students, uh, a psychoanalyst by the name of Ferenzi, um, argued that many of the traumas uh, that we experience and uh, one of the traumas that we experienced as, as a species um, is precisely that we left the ocean a very long time ago. And so according to Ferenczi, who is trying to expand Freud's understanding of trauma um, from a purely individual um, developmental perspective to a biological evolutionary um, deep time perspective, our ancestors' departure from the ocean meant that the world suddenly weighed on us in a fundamentally new way. Because once you exit the ocean, one of the first forces that you will feel, of course, is gravity. Uh, and so there is this uh, evolutionary trauma, according to Ferenczi, that explains a lot of our pathologies and that we often try to escape by returning to that oceanic boundlessness to that aquatic environment in one way or another. Uh, so this is how Ferenczi um, explains a lot of human behavior, including pathological behavior. It's as, as this desire to return to this original state um, of unity in the aquatic environment. Now, the second reflection I want to share here today is that Consciousness, independently of where it emerged and independently of where it went in its search for ever new uh, places in which to assert itself, is, as I argue in the book, teriomorphic. And this is a term that I um, made by combining the Greek root terio, which means beast or animal in Attic Greek, um, with the, the term morph, which means form or shape. And so what I mean when I say that consciousness is stereomorphic is that consciousness is not one thing that animals either have or don't have and have in the same way. Rather, consciousness will always take the form or of the particular animal that enacts it. And that means that aquatic animals will have an aquatic form of consciousness, let's say a liquid intelligence whereas terrestrial animals will have a kind of consciousness that is adapted to their mode of life. And that is true not just for large classifications of animals like aquatic versus terrestrial. It also applies at the level of particular species. Dogs have a dog consciousness. Uh, giraffes have a giraffe consciousness. But it may also apply all the way to individual to individual differences. Um, where our consciousness is stereomorphic all the way to the level of the individual, uh, the singular being that I am. Now, the third point here is that all animals, by necessity, evolve alongside with their milieu, meaning that we are in constant interaction with our environment, and as I put it here in the fourth point, our relationship to that environment is itself mediated by the kind of consciousness that we have. And the way in which I think about mind, at least when thinking about animals, is as an intermingling. So these are not three separate categories that I am about to list. They are three things that we can isolate through the use of, of argument and reason as a heuristic for making sense of things, but that in practice are deeply interconnected. And those three things are memory, animals remember, uh, they carry the past like a burden. Um, here we might also think of uh, Nietzsche's claim um, in the genealogy of morals that um, memory is always memory of trauma and burden, um, and thus experience itself is a burden that we carry with us. Secondly, we have perception. We perceive the world through the senses and our 
census will also depend on the kind of animal that we have, that, that we are. We know that some organisms have sensory modalities for which there is no human analog. Um, think about the perception of the Earth's magnetic pull in bees or in pigeons, or think about echolocation in bats and in dolphins. Um, uh, think about various forms of uh, chemical detection in other animals like octopuses, where we can't really tell if the right term for what they're doing is smelling or tasting because it's something else altogether. And so perception uh, is the animal's relationship to its current environment through the, through the senses. And finally, imagination, which is, of course, about envisioning other states of affair that do not hold in the here and now. And all of this is simply a way of saying that our relationship to our environment is mediated by this capacity that we have to remember, perceive, and imagine, which is to say, to keep the past in mind, use that to understand the present, and on the basis of that, project ourselves into the future. Uh, because, of course, memory is backwards looking, perception is present looking, and imagination is forward looking. But all those three form a structure that I call mind. Um, and that means that there is always a trace of the imaginative in memory and of the memorial in imagination and of both of them uh, in perception. I will conclude here simply by saying that even though um, I talk about the dreams of marine animals, there are some difficult cases um, around which we need to be careful. Um, and these are animals, especially aquatic animals, that test the limits of human science and of human thinking uh, more broadly. And I'm here thinking, if we just go to the next and final slide, of animals such as jellyfish. Jellyfish are considered to be the most ancient animal forms that still live on this planet. They do not have a brain. They do not have a centralized nervous system. Rather, what they have is a distributed net of nerves that don't look like anything that we find in the rest of the animal kingdom. And for a long time, the argument has been made that the neural organization of these animals is so simple, it's so minimalist, that it cannot possibly be sufficient for something like consciousness, for something like awareness. And recently, um, people have begun to put pressure on this idea. And one reason for this is because we have discovered that jellyfish, like all other animals, also sleep. They, they need sleep. When they don't get it, they need more of it in order to make up for the lack uh, in what is called um, uh, rebound sleep. And during sleep, they, they do perform the restorative functions that we typically that we typically associate with sleep in other animals. And so we know that these are animals that need to rest. Um, and uh, that means that for them, much like for us, sleep performs many of its functions, um, uh, potentially like some form of rudimentary memory consolidation, um, and maybe neural um, deactivation so that the animal uh, doesn't get overwhelmed by all the neural activity that is happening during the waking world, which is called neural, neural downscaling. And the fact that these animals sleep could suggest that they also dream, although if they do, I don't think we have the right language to talk about their dreams. Um, on the one hand, because of the absence of a centralized nervous system, and on the other hand, because of the alienness of their neural organization. And so it could be that here we're confronted with animals that sleep but don't dream, which in itself is fascinating, or with the ancient, most primal forms of life 
um, where some form of dream, however originary, however rudimentary, um, however rudimentary it may be, still speaks to this ability of the animal to perform a function typically associated with the waking state during its period of rest and quiescence. Um, but here we simply do not know at the moment. Uh, thank you very much. I will stop here.